thank you, Lonnie, for allowing me to fill these very large shoes up here. And I thank for the opportunity to serve you in Jesus' name. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. If you have your Bibles or if we have the scripture on the screen, I'd like to ask you to stand and turn to Nehemiah chapter 2. We'll read verses 1 through 8. Nehemiah is found just after Second Chronicles and Ezra. So sometimes uh, the lesser known books are harder to find, isn't it? In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when the wine was brought to him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins? and its gates have been destroyed by fire. The king said to me, What is it you want? Then I prayed to God in heaven, and I answered the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried, so that I can rebuild it. Then the king with the queen sitting beside him, ask me, how long will your journey take? And when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of the trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the royal forest, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence that I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was upon me and the king granted my request. Amen. You may be seated. The title of this sermon today is Plan, P-L-A-N, is not a bad four-letter word. However, today, this morning, together we are going to prove as we look at the story of Nehemiah that plan, in fact, is a very good four-letter word. Last Sunday, Pastor Lonnie spoke about what we are to do when God is calling us, when he calls us for something, when he calls us to act on something, when we get a heart awakening, a heart asking, asking, a heart ascertaining, and then a heart that should be advancing. This morning we will look at what Nehemiah did after he heard the bad news from Jerusalem and what advancing of the heart took place in his heart and his when he heard this call. From the text of Nehemiah chapter 1, we see that Nehemiah is sad and distressed about the conditions, the conditions of the walls and the gates in the city of Jerusalem. We also see that Nehemiah not only mourned 
and fasted upon the hearing of this news, but he prayed to God in heaven to make him successful in what he had to do. I'll pick up now and expand on this narrative. We'll read now from uh, Nehemiah chapter 2, just verse 1 and 2. In the month of Nisan, the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when the wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to him. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad? Are you not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. And I was very much afraid. He says he was afraid. The king noticed his countenance. He says, since Nisan spans uh, four months from, uh, around, and it happens around March or April, from when he heard the news, which was in the month of Kislev, which is approximately December. That month of Kislev, he heard that news, and now for four months he had been praying and fasting and planning in order to hear from heaven what he should do so that he would be ready when the opportunity arose. The king noticed Nehemiah's countenance. Many of you have heard me do the ironic benediction. In the ironic benediction, the Lord blesses the people through the priests. He says, may his countenance, the Lord's countenance, be on you. It's what our face sees, what people see. I'm not demeaning the mass, but think of what the mass do to us right now. People can't really see what we're thinking because our face reflects the countenance of what's in our heart. Then Nehemiah answered the king. Let's read verse 3 of chapter 2. But the king, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the cities where my fathers uh, are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Notice that he didn't say Jerusalem. He just said the city where my fathers are buried. He didn't want to do that because the king had actually stopped King Artaxerxes some years before in, a, in the book of Ezra, had actually stopped the construction and the rebuilding of Jerusalem because those detractors in that area had been resisting all that time and telling lies and sending letters back to the king that these Jews weren't going to listen to him and the city of Jerusalem would no longer belong to him. So he had stopped the rebuilding and construction, not knowing that there was an evil intent in those people. Back to God's countenance. When one acts according to God's will, our countenance, others will take notice. In this case, Nehemiah was actually risking his life. The king might have become suspicious that some kind of plot or insurrection, this sadness of heart, can also mean a bad or evil intent. Then verse 4 says, And the king said to me, What is it you want? Then I prayed to God in heaven. Notice he throws up a quick prayer to God in heaven. Those who throw up quick prayers, in Nehemiah's case especially, are showing that they had been praying and laying the foundation for a long time. So that quick prayer is thrown up real quick could be effective. Sometimes we just throw up a quick prayer and sometimes they're meaningful, but other times they're just kind of a shortcut to get on with the rest of our life. 
So this is evidence that Nehemiah was able to use this quick prayer and very rapidly, uh, but he'd been praying for months and months for what he would do. It says, then I prayed to God in heaven and I, the king answered me, or I answered the king. And if it pleases the king, if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city of Judah where my fathers are buried so that I may rebuild it. When the king asked Nehemiah, he said, what would your request be? Maybe put it another way, what do you want me to do? The king is saying to him. The king knew that Nehemiah wanted to make a request, and this question would be the first hint that the king would listen favorably. So Nehemiah, as I said, prayed quickly. Quick prayers are possible, sometimes necessary, and valid if one has prayed sufficiently beforehand. In the case, in this case, Nehemiah's prayer is evidence of that life live in constant communion with God. I would say he has indeed been praying without ceasing. The requests then are granted in verse six through eight, the king with the queen sitting beside him. And we don't know why that's mentioned. Could have been a festival, could have been some special time that he had called the queen to sit beside him. That wasn't normal. That's why it's mentioned here. So the queen is sitting beside him. She may be even one since they've, Nehemiah's been in this court for many, many years. So maybe she is a backer of Nehemiah and whispering in the king's ear even. He says, how long will this journey take? When will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. And I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of the trans-Euphrates. Trans-Euphrates, over here, let me see, here's uh, Ur and Babylon and, the, and uh, these cities in the, along in where the area we would call Iraq and Persia. And you go all the way up here to Haran or up to almost Turkey, and then you come back down. Well, that follows the Euphrates River and then the Sources and the Jordan River. So you always traveled by this trans-Euphrates route. You couldn't go straight across over to Jerusalem. Try to put the map in your mind here. Uh, I'm a map person, so I'm always talking for maps, but I don't have one to put up here. Anyhow, that's desert, and you couldn't very easily travel that. So while he's traveling that route, he needs protection because that's enemy territory, if you will, um, even though it's owned by Persia at the time. So he asked for a letter that he could... Uh, to the governors so he could have safe travel and uh, arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph. Asaph is a Hebrew name, the keeper of the king's forest. So he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple, for the city wall and the residence that I will occupy. And because of the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted these requests. How much time will you need, says the king? The text does not give Nehemiah's answer to that question of how long the work would take. Nehemiah, later in this book, five, chapter 5, verse 14, we will learn that he was governor of Jerusalem, for 12 years. No doubt, <clears throat> excuse me, no doubt the time he asked for was much shorter. 
and it has been suggested that he reported back to the king after the dedication of the walls within a year. And this is his, when he came back, he was reappointed then as governor for a longer period of time. Nehemiah planned carefully. He knew his precise needs. First, he needed letters of safe conduct, most likely a military escort, especially since Artaxerxes, as I had mentioned before, had stopped the restoration because of hostility in the region. He knew of Asaph, uh, the keeper of the king's forest, for he already knew that he was going to need a significant amount of timber and other materials for rebuilding the gates, the walls, and his residence, other dwellings also. It's interesting, many of the dwellings in the old city of Jerusalem were part of the wall. We find that in the city of Jericho and many of those cities, the walls were quite wide and many people dwelt in the wall or very near the wall. Uh, it was part of the fortification. The idea of trust in God brings me right now to a most important part of Nehemiah's plan. Maybe this might even be my favorite proverb. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. These verses express so eloquently and precisely the plan for our lives. It should be obvious that Nehemiah followed the principle of this proverb, and so should we. Pray, plan, yes, but first, trust in God, not ourselves, not our own understanding. Let's look at chapter 2 verses 9 and 10. So I went to the governors of Trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. And the king had also sent army officers and a cavalry with me. When Sanballat the Horonite, Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote their, the welfare of the Israelites. God was surely looking out for his people. Nehemiah had not asked for a military escort but he did get one. It may have been the king's idea. The context suggests that, that its significance was to convince Sanballat and the others that Nehemiah had the king's authority and support. Sanballat the Horite was probably the governor of Samaria and Tobiah the Amorite official was likely the governor of Amman, modern-day Jordan. When we look at these things, we can see this history of thousands of years ago is still repeating itself today, isn't it? Until we finally get it, the Bible keeps repeating it until we take heed of what God is trying to tell us. We will hear about their resistance uh, later in this series. And finally, here in uh, Nehemiah chapter 11 through 16, he says, I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few men. I had not told anyone 
what my God had put on my heart for Jerusalem. And there were no amounts with no mounts, horses, mules. We don't know what he rode. There were no, um, lost my place. There were no mounts with me except for the one that I was riding. By night, I went out through the valley gate towards the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem with which which had been broken down and its gates which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mouth to get through, so I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate, and the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or the officials or the others who would be doing this work. It's interesting here, and if you have a a map in your Bible or sometime go back and look, I did have one to show you, but... This distance that he traveled around all these gates, all these gates have specific meaning in where they're placed in the walls and what happens in those gates. That's why they have these strange names to those gates. And it's very interesting, but it's quite a trek around uh, the city of Jerusalem today or back then. Smaller back then, but still... uh, a long ride or walk, several miles. Um, But he's doing this and he's inspecting to see what are the real conditions here? What is it going to take to rebuild? What logistics is he going to need? But notice he doesn't want even the people he's coming to support, the priest and the Jews in the city, because there's some resistance both from the enemy and from the friendly forces. We have that in our churches nowadays, don't we? We've never done it that way before here. Don't come in here and start changing things. Don't mess it up. We're used to what we like to do, and we resist. Even though God's involved, sometimes we don't hear him. We want to just keep it the way we had it. So Nehemiah's being pretty wise here. He's inspecting, checking out, but he's not announcing. He's waiting until Nehemiah in these verses proved himself to be a hard worker. Hard work alone does not always ensure success. It must be the right work at the right time done in the right way. That takes planning plan. Praying and trusting in God does not mean that research is not necessary. Nehemiah wanted to assess the situation before presenting this project to the officials and the people. Specifically, Nehemiah needed to know where to rebuild the old walls and where to construct new ones. So as not to call attention to what he was doing, he did not want that opposition, as I said before, to know what he was doing before he started. Nehemiah's wise leadership is evident. Some things are better not publicized before their time. Nehemiah was to face many problems and much opposition but his sense of divine direction would give him confidence. He was humbly aware that it was God who had entrusted the project to him. He used a king, but this is God's idea. And he said he would entrust him and project him 
to project the project to him, he would give him wisdom by which he would accomplish this mission. His mission was to restore Jerusalem to an environment that was pleasing to God. Then he goes to the people and he said to them in verses 17 through 8 and 18, then he said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come and let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God upon me and what the king had said to me. And they replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. Nehemiah was able to discern the proper time to present this building project, and he knew how to motivate the leaders and the people. He used four incentives. He identified with the people. He spoke of the trouble that we are in together. He stressed the seriousness of the situation. A leader must be realistic and honestly assess the facts. The people will have confidence in such a leader. Nehemiah committed to taking definite action. When the people see that, they'll join in. He used his personal testimony of God's grace to ensure that God's favor was on this project. As a side note, I would say Christian leaders today must encourage trust in God by leading in faith as well as in action. Building for unity. The community starts rebuilding the wall. The rest of chapters two and three show Nehemiah was an outstanding organizer. Some 45 sections of construction are mentioned, including 10 gates, planning all this activity, organizing the groups, plus arranging the infrastructure. We hear a lot about that today, don't we? Arranging the infrastructure to supply the materials, manpower. That was no small accomplishment. Can you imagine cutting the beams in the forest, probably up in what we call modern day Lebanon, bringing that timber in, getting it to the right gate at the right time, getting some, all the other supplies there and people to be there at the right time to do this job. And somebody to cook some food while they were working on the wall, somebody else to keep watch from the enemy. There's a lot of logistics and planning here. This cooperative effort, um, the people from all professions and trades helped, coming from many other villages outside Jerusalem. Nehemiah skillfully divided the workforce into some 40 manageable work crews. It states that in uh, chapter 3. They were organized by common interest in, and geography. The way Nehemiah confronted the opposition from both without and from within and the way he organized the community were significant ingredients in the realization of this process. As I told you before, some of the homes were built into the walls or near the walls. So he gave responsibility to the people who lived in the house and where that wall was broken, they had a, a real part in rebuilding their own house. So then when they did that, then they maybe went over and helped their neighbor. But Nehemiah, through God, through Nehemiah, is organizing all this. In conclusion, I would like to say God's plan for restoration of Jerusalem after the exile, preparing a man, Nehemiah, of faith and prayer over the years of servicing, of serving King Artaxerxes, Arta, 
Artaxerxes, and God prepared Nehemiah, giving him all the skills, uh, communication and physical and mental skills he would need for this task to come. We will see in the future that in spite of opposition and ridicule, Nehemiah refused to be deterred from this work. Plan is certainly a good four-letter word. But prayer and trust in the Lord always comes first. May we have the faith to pray and trust in the Lord like Nehemiah did. Amen.